Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Paul Numerick. I'm a member of the faculty here at the Methodist Theological School in Ohio. My area is religion and interreligious relations. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm up here to introduce this evening, because it's uh, so close to my heart. I want to welcome all of you to our campus, uh, point out that this is the Williams Institute. Uh, and so you find some information on, on your uh, programs about the Williams Institute, as well as the Theological Commons, which uh, sponsors many uh, such events on our campus. Um, and to point out that this is the first of two lectures, there'll be another lecture uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock in this very uh, space. So we want to invite you to that. And if you're around at 1 p.m. tomorrow, um, also our chapel will be around this uh, topic. Um, there, there's another reason why I'm uh, here to introduce our speaker uh, with a little backstory, because this is not the first time uh, uh, Dr. Pressler uh, has been with us. Back in the spring for our uh, consortium annual lecture, the Theological Consortium of Greater Columbus has an annual lecture. So back in April, uh, he was the speaker uh, with a similar topic. It was called Challenges and Opportunities in Christian-Muslim uh, Relations. And I recall about 10 minutes into, no, three minutes into your talk, I said to the person next to me, this guy is good. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I was instrumental in bringing him here, but I didn't know what we had. So um, in consulting with our dean and our president, who are also there, um, they said, he's good. Can we have him come back? And so guess what? You're back. And so we welcome you back. I, I want to share just a little uh, more information than you have on your program. On the back of the program, uh, in addition to the William Institute information and the theological comments, I have a real short biography of our, of our speaker, but let me uh, elaborate a little bit on that. Um, the Reverend Canon Dr. Titus Pressler served as principal of Edwards College in Peshawar, Pakistan, beginning in 2011, and now considers himself principal in exile. Uh, Edwards College was established in 1900 uh, and today has 2,800 undergraduate and graduate students as an institution of the Church of Pakistan. 90% of its faculty, students, and staff are uh, Muslim. So quite a background in Pakistan and in fact the talk in April was about perspectives from Pakistan. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Presser uh, also served as uh, President, Dean, and a uh, professor uh, of mission and world evangelism at the Seminary of the Southwest in Austin, Texas, where among other accomplishments, he developed an academic program in mission and world Christianity. His many courses uh, in his teaching uh, career have included um, these two, Meeting the Other, Christian World Mission in the 21st Century, and Gospel and Culture, Tension and Embrace. Uh, many presentations and consultations over the years, um, including these of note, um, meetings of the Global Episcopal Mission Network, the Lambeth Conference, the U.S.-Pakistan Interreligious Consortium, and a consultation with moderate Muslim leaders in Egypt, Qatar, and Oman. Um, he comes with the goods. Uh, to speak to this topic, and we welcome him back to Central Ohio. His uh, lecture topic for tonight, part one of two, um, titled Christian Muslim Maelstrom, Analyzing and Theologizing a Crisis. So we uh, welcome you, and please help me welcome uh, Reverend Canon Dr. Titus Preston. Thank you so much, Professor Numrick for that kind introduction. And it is indeed wonderful to be back in central Ohio. And I, I do have some background in Ohio. I grew up as a child of missionaries in India. And the only two years that I spent in this country before coming back for college myself were in Oberlin because I had siblings who were going to Oberlin College and my mother was a student at the Oberlin Graduate School of Theology in those days. So it's a great joy to be back in Ohio and, and also an honor and a pleasure to be among you for the Williams Institute. And thank you all for being here 
tonight, and I also greet those who may be looking online. I understand that this is being streamed, and so we can imagine multitudes out there <laughs> listening to this presentation. And it's been a, a, a great joy over the past couple of days to learn more about the life and work of the Methodist Theological School in Ohio, MTSO, and about the vision and work that you are undertaking to overcome racism in our society, and then the very novel initiatives in eco-theology on the seminary farm and beyond. My topic this evening is Christian Muslim Maelstrom, Analyzing and Theologizing a Crisis. From a Muslim standpoint, I speak in the name of God, the most merciful and the most beneficent. From a Christian standpoint, I speak in the name of God who gave birth to the Word, God the Word made flesh, and God the Spirit who empowers the Word for life. Amen. Before launching into analysis and theology, I'd like to share some glimpses some vignettes of Christian Muslim crisis as experienced by Christians in Pakistan. Today is All Saints Day, when we celebrate saints of the faith who have gone before us. So I begin with two martyrs of the faith. On Sunday, the 22nd of September, 2013, two suicide bombers entered the premises of All Saints Church in Peshawar in Pakistan while those who had just attended worship were sharing a meal in the courtyard outside. Rice, dal, tea, and that sort of thing. The bomb blast killed 128 people and wounded close to 200. The Taliban claimed responsibility and said that the attack was retribution for the CIA's drone strikes on Taliban and Haqqani network operatives in Waziristan south of Peshawar. One of those killed in the suicide bombing was Merab Naim, one of our students at Edwards College, where I was principal. I first met Merab in 2012 in trying to redress a wrong that she had suffered. After her two-year associate's degree at Edwards, she applied for our Bachelor of Science program in engineering. She'd been admitted but during the interviews, she had been harassed by two Muslim faculty members who jokingly criticized her essay because she had written that she wished to attend Edwards partly because it is a church-sponsored college. You see, as Paul explained, among our 3,000 students, only about 200 are Christians. And among our 105 faculty members, about 15 are Christians. So as in society, Christians are a minority at Edwards a church college. A Christian lecturer bought, brought Merab and her story to me as principal, so I heard her out and then addressed the matter with the two faculty members involved. They denied that they had harassed her, but the point was made. Merab, in my recollection, was a quiet and composed person. She did not put herself forward, but she had inner confidence. Her friends say that she was keen on reconciliation. She used to solve disputes among them. And she even engaged in interfaith dialogue among her friends, which is a sensitive and many times dangerous enterprise in Peshawar. She read a lot and she enjoyed playing badminton. Academically, she stood second in her class at the end of the third year. And her ambition was to teach someday at Edwards College. Merab was 19 when she was killed in the bombing. Merab's father was Naim Nazir. Age 42, he was the choir director at All Saints Church. And I recall his powerful charisma in leading that group cross-legged in one of the transepts of the church with harmonium and tabla. And you'll see some scenes of that in the picture show. But my most vivid impression of him was during the 2000 strong procession on, on Easter morning through the streets of the old city of Peshawar. We started from the church at 4 a.m. singing Easter hymns in Urdu. At the first station under Kohati Gate, Naim, 
who had led the procession called a jalous for 30 years, that is, since he was age 12, read aloud in Pashto, Matthew 28, 1 through 10, used as the Easter vigil gospel around the world, and then briefly preached on it, all of this at high volume, amplified by the public address system in the back of a pickup truck. This is our evangelism, he said to me as we walked along together. He noted that Pashto was important for reaching old city res residents, for many of them don't know Urdu. In the crowd as a whole, there was a sense of energy being released, energy pent up during most of the year when Christians do not feel safe discussing re religion at all, much less bearing witness publicly to their faith. Naim was also a theological educator, for he was provincial coordinator for the Open Theological Seminary, an extension program that leads to various certificates and degrees. Naeem regularly taught three or four OTS courses at All Saints, where he had about 35 students. After the first bomb went off on the church grounds on September 22nd, Naeem tackled the second bomber and wrestled him to the ground. But that did not prevent the bomb from going off. Naeem's wife, Merab's mother, was Mona. Although not injured in the blast, Mona died not long after the blast, shocked to death at the killing of her husband and daughter. Left alone was Shalom, a ninth grader. A few days after the All Saints bombing, a young Muslim faculty member on study leave at the time wrote to me as follows by email. I really am grieved for the loss of my Christian brothers and sisters, and I strongly condemn this barbaric act of violence over my Pakistani brothers and sisters. Please convey my sincere sympathy to my Christian brothers and sisters. May the departed souls rest in peace, and Allah protect all of us from further loss. But with due apology, sir, may I dare to ask that have you ever considered the loss of innocent lives by drone attacks within the tribal belt of Pakistan? Please raise your voice to cut the roots of this menace and try to reach to the root causes of such loss of precious human souls, either by suicide bombing or by bomb blasts or by drones or any other means of violence. Whoever carried out the suicide attacks, he said, are neither Muslims nor are they having respect for religion and neither do they have humanity in their hearts. End of quote. Pressure on Christian institutions is a different manifestation of religious conflict. Edwards College was founded in 1900 by the Church Mission Society of the Church of England, which turned it over to the indigenous church in 1940. During a nationalization drive in the 1970s, the provincial government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa expropriated by fiat a majority of seats on the Board of Governors a situation that the church opposed but had to live with, especially in light of the country's drift towards Islamization and radicalization. The college has long awarded its degrees through the University of Peshawar, where outdated syllabi and sclerotic politics hold genuine education hostage. All agreed that it was high time for Edwards to become a university on its own, and the provincial government even awarded us over $3 million to help make that happen. But when our draft charter proposed that the church be restored to its historic and rightful role in college governance, fierce opposition ensued. The bishop and I were threatened, and then I was physically beaten by agents of the military's inter-services intelligence and threatened with death if I didn't leave the country. As it turned out, I wasn't able to leave the country for three months because the agents had ripped my visa out of my passport. But during those three months, I was hosted in Islamabad by a Muslim, a Muslim who supports passionately the rights of religious minorities in Pakistan. I'm now in exile from that work while the church seeks to resolve the situation in the courts. A couple of other vignettes. While sitting with my friend Akbar Ahmad, the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University in Washington, I was moved when he, as a Pakistani-American Muslim, 
suggested that in the wake of the beating, I draw strength from the suffering of Jesus on the cross. It was clear that he, as a Muslim, had contemplated at depth the mystery of the cross. And then finally, that reminded me of another experience of empathy in another direction. During one Muharram in Peshawar, the city was closed down in order to prevent violence against Shias commemorating the death of Hussein ibn Ali, grandson of Muhammad, at the Battle of Karbala in the seventh century. The Shia commemorations often featuring bloody self-flagellations in the streets that enrage Sunnis. It was empathy that drew me that day to listen to Bach's St. Matthew's Passion as I worked alone in my study on that somber day because the whole city, including the college, was closed down. Jesus tortured and then executed. Ali assassinated in the seventh century. Shias whipping themselves and persecuted and all drawn together by the shedding of blood. Now I move to the topic of grievance accumulation in the religionscape of the 21st century. The global community must address, in my view, three major crises in the 21st century. Three overarching crises that are unlikely to be resolved entirely even 100 years hence. The poverty crisis, in which over 2 billion of the world's people live on less than $3 a day. The environmental crisis, which is driven by human-generated climate change, and the interreligious crisis of whether people of different religions can live together in peaceful coexistence. The interreligious crisis involves virtually all the religions, but it is focused mainly on the relations between Christians and Muslims, who constitute respectively the world's two most populous religions, with Christians currently numbering 2.1 billion and Muslims numbering 1.6 billion. Christian Muslim maelstrom. The word maelstrom comes from early modern Dutch. I'll bet you didn't know that. Combining the word melen, which means to whirl, and stroom, meaning stream. The word denoted a mythical whirlpool that the Dutch supposed to exist in the Arctic Ocean. So literally a maelstrom is a state wherein there's a whirlpool in the sea or in a river. And metaphorically, a maelstrom is a state of confused movement or violent turmoil. Synonyms are turbulence, tumult, turmoil, disorder, disarray, chaos. I think we would all agree that those words describe much in the encounter between Muslims and Christians today. Tensions in Christian-Muslim relations in our time can scarcely be overestimated. On one side, we see such events as 9-11, churches burning in Egypt, the atrocities of ISIS against Christian communities in the Middle East, and anti-Christian violence in Pakistan. On another side, we've seen a US presidential candidate proposing to ban Muslims from entering the United States, German right-wingers marching against Islam, efforts to halt Muslim migration through Greece, and attacks on Muslims and on mosques in Europe and the USA. And then there are the countries where major conflict between Muslims and Christians has been underway for years. Nigeria, where Boko Haram is a relative latecomer to the interreligious violence that has long gripped the north of that country. The center of North Africa, where Muslim-Christian conflict resulted in the separation of South Sudan from Sudan in 2011 an event which many people celebrated, but it was also an event to mourn. Here again, Christians and Muslims unable to coexist, resulting in a national separation. And we've all seen what's been happening in South Sudan since. And then Malaysia, where Christians in 2014 were forbidden to use the name that they had long used for God, Allah. What makes these events and many others like them so challenging is the phenomenon of grievance accumulation, a 
piling up of injuries that stimulates comprehensive generalizations about the adversary. For many Christians in both the two-thirds world and the one-third world, injuries at the hands of Muslims stimulate generalizations such as that Islam is inherently intolerant, that violence is lodged firmly in the heart of Islam, that all Muslims are potential terrorists. For many Muslims in both the two-thirds world and the one-third world, injuries at the hands of Christians stimulate generalizations such as that Christianity is inherently intolerant, that violence is lodged firmly in the heart of Christianity, that the West is at war with Islam. Let me just address that phrase, the West, for a moment. Ambiguity between the West and Christianity is a factor that we must note at the outset. Acknowledging the secular drift of Western Europe and North America, many scholarly and journalistic writers refer generically to relations between the West and the Muslim world, or the West and the world of Islam. Those are asymmetric phrases, pairing on the one hand a region, and on the other hand, a religion. The phrases do not exclude Christianity as an element in the relationship, but neither do they confine the interaction with Islam to Christianity, which is appropriate. But we must also acknowledge that the West is not monolithically secular, and not all people in majority Muslim countries are Muslim. And not all the Muslims there are especially devout, nor would all even say that, Mus that Islam is their primary self-identification rather than, say, scientist, or poet, or business person, or media commentator. Conversely, the Taliban's frequent reference to Western forces in Afghanistan as crusaders reminds us not only of the historic grievance of the crusades that began 900 years ago, but also that what Westerners might see as a secular geopolitical initiative is perceived by some Muslims as inherently religious and inherently hostile to Islam. I turn now to challenges we face in our thinking, analyzing the crisis. And I've been glad to see that in the MTSO curriculum, there is the category of the study of religion and interreligious relations. Remarkably, your category of the study of religion is absent from most seminary catalogs. <laughs> it being assumed that all faculty and students know what religion is. And we just need to get about detailing the elements of our particular religion, of Christianity. So in the spirit of your inquiry, I offer you, I offer you at the outset my definition of religion. You can see that I'm brash. Here's my definition. Religion is the dimension of human individual and social experience that is concerned with relationships between human beings and reality experienced as supernatural or divine. And then two other explanatory statements. These relationships are experienced in thought, emotion, and morality. And they are pictured in an idealized way in ritual. And a particular religion is the comprehensive religious pattern of thought and practice that a social group shares and develops over time. Now, with those understandings, I offer you an overall exhortation about our thinking related to the religious, interreligious crisis, the crisis between Christians and Muslims today. The overall exhortation is this think religiously about this interreligious crisis. Think religiously about this interreligious crisis. This exhortation has several strands. First, focus on religion amid the press of politics. Keep attuned to the religious dimension amid the current debates raging about the relationship of Islam to Christianity and the West. The debates are political, and politics is important because it concerns the use and distribution of power to achieve goals and get work done. But as Christian and Muslim citizens, we cannot confine our concern to the political. We are religiously committed, whether 
Christian or Muslim, or Hindu or Jain or Sikh. Christianity or Islam is intrinsic to our identity. We must consider the crisis from a religious standpoint, pray about the crisis from a religious standpoint, and act in the crisis from a religious standpoint. So the first strand is focus on the religious as well as the political. Second, the second strand of my exhortation to think religiously is this. Recognize the reality of religious motivation. I say this in order to counter a denial reflex that commonly kicks in for many people when violence related to religion occurs. The denial reflex is clear in a placard carried at a demonstration earlier this year in New York City. Terrorism has no religion, proclaimed the placard. The placard expressed a wish, but it does not fit the facts. Terrorism often does have a religion. It may be Islam as in the San Bernardino, Paris, and recent New York and New Jersey killings and the atrocities of ISIS. It may be Christianity, as in the killings at a planned parenthood clinic in Colorado Springs last November and in church-sanctioned lynchings of African Americans in the 19th and 20th centuries. That was domestic terrorism. It may be Judaism, as in killings by settlers on the West Bank. It may be Hinduism, as in killings in Gujarat in 2002, when a thousand Muslims were killed. It may be Sikhism, as in the insurgency in Indian Punjab in the 1980s. It may even be, get this, Buddhism. Religious minorities in Myanmar and Sri Lanka are experiencing Buddhist terrorism. The denial reflex insists that those who kill in the name of religion are not, in fact, Muslims or Christians, Hindus or whatever, because so the arguments go, Islam is a religion of peace. Jesus taught nonviolence, or Hinduism would never condone killing, and so on. This response is well-meaning. It attempts to shield faithful religionists from a horrified but prejudice-prone public equating this or that religion, most acutely Islam at the moment, with the violence perpetrated by some of its adherents. But asserting that violent killers are not members of the religion they profess doesn't fit the facts. Robert Deere, who shot people in Colorado last year, had idiosyncratic views of Christianity that were probably affected by mental illness, but his statements indicated that he was in the orbit of Christian fundamentalism. Not only were the San Bernardino killers apparently inspired by ISIS, which has a systematically developed theology. But Saeed Farouk attended mosque regularly, and Tashfin Malik was known to be devout. The Paris killers, they shouted, Allahu Akbar, as they killed. Denying that religious killers are genuinely religious not only denies facts, it forecloses the one most promising means of countering such extremism. And that is for religious communities to take responsibility for our fundamentalists, our extremists, our militants, and try to transform the mindsets and contexts in which such fundamentalist militancy takes root. For if the attackers in Paris or San Bernardino were not Muslims, if their attacks had nothing to do with Islam, which many both Muslims and non-Muslims often claim, nothing to do with Islam, then that means that US American and French Muslim communities are absolved from trying to address the root causes of the extremism being embraced by many of their young people. It is other Muslims though, not any non-Muslims who have the best chance of persuading them otherwise. Let's look at Christian instances. Jim Jones, the pastor who famously induced close to a thousand followers to drink the poisoned Kool-Aid at Jonestown in Guyana in 1979 did not start out as a paranoid pro-communist politico, but as a standard issue liberal United Methodist minister, and one who had a prominent social justice outreach. The Branch Davidians at Waco, Texas, were like many Christians worldwide in taking lots of marching orders from the Old Testament, much like African-initiated churches that I've researched and prayed with in Zimbabwe, in which I would certify as genuinely Christian. 
So the Branch Davidians Christianity was different from that of most Christians in this room, or at least I would hope so. No laughs. But they self-identified as Christians, and that must be taken seriously and at face value. It is Christians, not non-Christians, who have the best chance of persuading Christian extremists to take more moderate stances. In sum, if we in the religions wash our hands of our militants, the future holds only more bloodshed, not the hoped for day of tolerance and peace. Now, a few other notes about this. The words real and true are two obfuscating adjectives that are often used in these discussions. The Paris attackers, it is said, were not true Muslims. David Koresh was not a real Christian. Hindu nationalists are not true Hindus. Violent Israeli settlers are not real Jews. In using such adjectives, mainstream religionists are making theological assessments by which they wish to quarantine themselves and their communities from guilt by association. Yet all the marginal groups in question self-identify as Hindu, Jew, Christian, Muslim, whatever, and therefore have a legitimate claim to be considered so. Besides, we have our own history of Roman Catholics seeing Protestants and Anglicans as not real or true Christians, and vice versa. And our own history of Anglicans regarding Puritans and nonconformists as not real or true Christians, and vice versa. And many fundamentalist Christian groups today not recognizing mainliners like ourselves as real or true Christians, and vice versa. This history should make us suspicious of the adjectives real and true in discussions of religiously motivated violence. In other words, denying someone their religious identity should not be our response to substantial disagreement with them. What we Christians should be saying about our extremists is, yes, they are Christians, but they are misguided and mistaken Christians. And we must address the reasons why they are adopting these views and undertaking these destructive actions. What Muslims should be saying about their extremists is, yes, they are Muslim, but they are misguided and mistaken Muslims. And we must address the reasons why they are adopting these views and undertaking these destructive actions. A common platitude amid these events is this. Our religion does not condone violence and atrocity. No religion condones such acts. The fact is that every religion has elements in its scriptures and traditions that twisted minds can and will twist to justify violence and atrocity. Jewish scripture has many exhortations to violence and territorial conquest. From Jesus, there is the statement, I came to bring not peace, but a sword. And many predictions of judgment with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Seek out the enemy relentlessly, says the Quran. God has exalted the men who fight with their goods and persons above those who stay at home. Mainline Jewish, Christian, and Muslim theological communities have interpretive strategies that contextualize or otherwise neutralize such sayings. But there are other theological communities within each religion that encourage literal and extreme implementations. So second, recognize the reality of religious motivation. Third, third strand of thinking religiously about the interreligious crisis. The third strand is this, recognize the power of religion in society. On a global basis, discussion of religious conflict is sometimes critiqued as misrepresenting complex social phenomena as religious. Such conflicts, it is said, and this is often from a very worldly wise standpoint, or a sociologically informed standpoint, or a politically informed standpoint, such conflicts, it is said, are really political, economic, and ethnic in motivation aim. And religion is simply being used as a pretext for such ends. I'm sure you've heard that. A couple of responses to this. First, the tendency to discount the role of religion in societies today reflects 20th century European and North American academic and cultural assumptions about the marginalization of religion amid the supposed inevitability of secularization. 
People in the West thought that the five impacts of Enlightenment rationalism, Darwinian evolution, Marxist communism, Freudian psychology, and market, Marxist cap, uh, I'm sorry, market capitalism would make religion irrelevant in the modern world. But that has turned out to be just one more ethnocentric projection from the West onto the rest of the world. The 21st century is indelibly religious in the West as well as the rest. This development has been especially shocking for Western European societies that thought that they had become mostly secular. Second, all social conflicts are complex involving multiple factors. And all social conflicts concern distribution of power among groups and thus are inherently political. But it is just as possible for power to be contested between groups that define themselves by religious affiliation as it is for power to be contested between groups that define themselves by economic or ethnic interest. When people fight, they are fighting for power for their group and the religious identity of their group may be just as important to them as its ethnic, linguistic, national, or economic identity, or even more important. This is not to say that religion is the only factor, far from it, but that religion is a factor alongside the others, not subsidiary to them. It's tempting to speak of independent and dependent variables and insist that religion is an independent variable just like the others. That would be one way to look at it. But in fact, all these variables are interdependent, and they are equally interdependent. Ethnicity, language, economics, religion, all these variables interact with each other on an equal basis, with one or another being more prominent in specific instances. Religion can have just as much power as the others as a human motivation and as a factor in social analysis. So the third strand is recognize the power of religion in society. In sum, my overall theme in this first part of today's tonight's talk is recognize, uh, rather think religiously about the interreligious crisis. Then first, focus on religion amid the press of politics. Second, recognize the reality of religious motivation. And third, recognize the power of religion in society. Now from analyzing the crisis, I turn now to how we might do theology in the maelstrom of Christian-Muslim conflict. My first suggestion is this, incarnational humility. Incarnational humility. We're all in favor of humility. So what do I mean by incarnational humility? I suggest this stance as a Christian and I suggest it to Christians. For the criterion of the incarnation of God in Christ is obviously not one that I can suggest to Muslims. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That declaration in the prologue to John's gospel clarifies that the pre-existing eternal and creative word of God whom we theologize as the second person of the Trinity became fully human in Christ Jesus and lived a human life and died a human death. The implications of that incarnation are developed in the Christ hymn in the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. And you know the passage well. Have this mind among you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and being found in human form he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. The kenosis, signified by Christ emptying himself, has a profound and paradoxical implication for engagement with Muslims. The major import of the Christ hymn's unfolding of the incarnation is the renunciation of prerogative, with particular emphasis on Christ giving up the prerogative of divine position and power. Christ gave up omnipotence. Now some Christians might dispute that by pointing to Jesus' miracles and concluding that Jesus could have done anything he wanted, but simply chose not to do so. My response is that Jesus' miracles, which by the way I believe truly occurred, 
were not a function of divine power, which had been given up in the incarnation, but a fruit of Jesus' faithfulness in prayer. It is through faithfulness, not through inherent divine power, that Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. An obvious implication of the incarnation is that Christ also gave up omnipresence. For Jesus, the human being, was like any human being, living a, in a physical body in time and space, and limited by time and space. Indeed, I suggest that the obvious aspect, that that obvious aspect of kenosis is the model for everything in Christ's kenosis. So we turn to the classical third omniprerogative of divinity, which is omniscience. And this is the quality that Christians have felt much more ambivalent about in relation to the second person of the Trinity, incarnate in Jesus of Nazareth. But it also appears in the assumptions of ordinary Christians. I recall discussing it with a Shona Anglican nun as we drove around among our congregations in the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe near the Mozambique border. Her view prompted me to ask her at one point, Sister Alice, so do you think Jesus knew what was happening in Zimbabwe? when he was walking around in Palestine? Oh yes, Father, she replied. Well, the canonic movement of the Incarnation points toward Jesus not only not knowing what was happening in Zimbabwe, but not knowing a great deal that was close at hand around him. The very fact that his ministry began only at age 30 indicates a long period of reflection learning and formation that culminated with particular realizations at his baptism at the hands of John the Baptizer. Like us, he needed news to know what was happening around him. Who do people say that I am, he asked his disciples, not as a test, but because he wanted and needed to know. And he treasured Peter's declaration that he was the Christ because it confirmed his own hunch. Even Jesus' sense of his own mission developed through engagement with others. Jesus went to, to Tyre and Sidon, foreign territory, not on mission, but as a retreat from mission. He'd had it, didn't want to do any more mission, at least for a bit, a vacation. And the Syrophoenicians' plucky reply to his rebuff, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table, that enlarged Jesus' vision for the scope of his mission. From a foreigner, from a woman, So did the faith of the centurion who sought healing for his servant. Not even in Israel have I seen such faith, said Jesus. In short, Jesus was not omniscient. And yet Jesus was confident about the kernel of his identity and mission, that he had a unique relation to God and that in him the reign of God was breaking forth on the cosmos. As Christ in incarnation relinquished omniscience, so must we relinquish the presumption of omniscience in our Christian deportment. If the Jesus at the center of our faith was not theologically omnipotent, not theologically omniscient, how can we, even with 2,000 years of reflection, even with Martin Luther, even with John Calvin, imagine that, how can we imagine that we are theologically omniscient? So what does this entail for interreligious encounter? What it has entailed for me is this. I went to Peshawar as an Anglican priest and theological educator, confident of the gospel, and as a creedal Christian, both evangelical and Catholic, in my orientation. I was invited to lead a long-standing church college that has a majority Muslim constituency. Here was a remarkable opportunity to engage Islam nurture community between Muslims and Christians, cultivate tolerance among both groups and live in solidarity with the persecuted Christian minority. I also went because I was confident that I had more to learn about God in the company of Muslims. I'd grown up among Hindus in India. I had ministered among Shona spirit religionists in Zimbabwe. Especially in the environment of this century, I wanted to engage with Muslims and with Islam. I was going as a Christian, not as a theological agnostic or relativist, yet aware that there was more to learn about God with people on a very different path. Incarnational humility, 
In the path of the incarnation, we engage with other religionists confident in our faith, yet in incarnational ignorance. We engage with the humility of acknowledging that we are far from knowing everything and that we have much to learn. We enter expectantly, looking for how our experience of God will grow in depth and texture. With Muslims in particular, this type of engagement must acknowledge that historically Christians have not always engaged Islam with incarnational humility. As a missiologist, I insist that the historical record is varied. There was sometimes the arrogant presumption of self-sufficient omniscience, and there was sometimes the spirit of humble inquiry, including among my 19th century, get that, 19th century British predecessors on the frontier with Afghanistan. Worthington Jukes, for instance, you actually saw his, his memorial tablet in these pictures. Worthington Jukes served in Peshawar during the 1870s and 1880s and was responsible for All Saints Church in Peshawar being designed and constructed according to the design of a mosque. Such was his respect for Muslim spirituality and worship. There is irony in the high but canonic Christology that I'm suggesting for Christians and the view of the Prophet Muhammad that is often held by Muslims. In rejecting the incarnation of God in Christ Jesus, Muslims typically insist that Jesus was just a human being, like Muhammad was just a human being. Yet on the other side, Muhammad is held in such reverence that no visual representation of him is permitted, any disparagement of him is regarded as a blasphemy worthy of the death penalty, and mention of his name must be followed by the phrase, peace be upon him. How does a high but canonic Christology compare with what we might term the high Muhammadology? That's, that's a word that I'm coining. A high Muhammadology among many Muslims? I think that's an important question for Muslim-Christian conversation. Similarly, the mainstream Christian view of the scripture of the Old and New Testaments connects directly with the incarnation and contrasts with the Muslim view of the Quran. In a way, correlative to how Jesus was a human being affected by the time and place where he was born and lived, we view our sacred scriptures as documents shaped by the historical periods in which they were written and by the cultural, social, economic, political, and theological backgrounds of their writers. Far from being scandalized by the differences among our four Gospels, and I might add, unlike fundamentalist Christians who seek to resolve all literal differences among them, we rejoice in the distinctive perspectives of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and their respective communities. Unlike Martin Luther, we're fine with James being in the canon as a counterpoint to the equally important insights of Paul. Our view that the biblical writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit contrasts with the Muslim view that the Quran was dictated by Allah to Muhammad. As Shadi Hamid of the Brookings Institution notes in his current book, Islamic Exceptionalism, Christians believe that the Bible is the word of God, whereas for Muslims, the Quran is the speech of God. The counterpart to the Muslim view of the Quran is not so much the Bible as Jesus himself, as the incarnate word of God. But as I've emphasized, the emptied incarnate word of God. So the Muslim view of the Quran builds in a certain interpretive rigidity that many Christians do not feel in relation to their Bible. Our embrace of the incarnational nature of both Jesus and script, Christian scripture our acknowledgement of the limitations posed by incarnation often strikes Muslims as a sign of weakness, an expression of uncertain faith. Christian engagement must always be guided by the weakness of the incarnation, a weakness that comes to dreadful fulfillment in the weakness of the cross. Indeed, the Christ hymn of Philippians 2 regards the cross as the culmination of Christ's self-emptying and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. 
The Johannine community grasped the paradoxical nettle firmly in their insistence that on the cross, with all of its degradation, its humiliation, its abandonment, Jesus was glorified. <laughs> I mean, that embrace of paradox, of contradiction, for Muslims, Jesus may have been crucified, but he did not die, for that would signify defeat. For us, torture and death on a cross signifies God's love in God becoming so vulnerable that God was willing to suffer, be defeated, and die. For Muslims, our view is a theological atrocity that cannot be countenanced. Embracing the weakness and vulnerability of the Incarnation, we as Christians must not be tempted into contests of strength and contests of certitude in interreligious dialogue. For when we succumb, we are relinquishing the theological paradox we claim is at the heart of our faith. We preach Christ crucified, declared Paul to the Corinthians, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks to which we might add an outrage to Muslims. I cannot suggest to my Muslim sisters and brothers the stance they might take in interfaith dialogue, but explaining the incarnational stance we take is helpful for our conversation. Now, I'm very aware that the Cubs are playing tonight. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> And, and Cleveland's playing, too. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to uh, skip them some things and, and, and leave them till the morning. But I'd like to just close with a few stories around the theme of mutual discovery. We've talked about incarnational humility, and now I want to close with mutual discovery. Peshawar is an environment of violence, often prompted by religion. The vast majority of my interactions were with Muslims, so I needed to avoid giving offense. Nevertheless, I welcomed religious conversation initiated by others, and I sometimes initiated religious conversation myself. And I did so eagerly, for I was in Pakistan, as I've said, partly to learn something more about God in the company of Muslims. Here are several examples. One colleague, a Shiite, took me aside after the cathedral liturgy during which I was licensed in the Diocese of Peshawar. During the worship, there were several places where something called the Holy Spirit was mentioned. He said, what is this Holy Spirit? I've not heard of that before, so can you tell me something about the Holy Spirit? Now, this was despite the fact that the Holy Spirit is mentioned four times in the Quran, thrice in connection with Jesus being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and once in connection with the origin of the Quran. Nevertheless, what ensued was a discussion of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity, from creation to Pentecost and the role of the Holy Spirit in Christian life today. On another occasion, I asked a physics lecturer what his particular interests were in his field. Parallel universes and the wormholes between them, he replied. I find those possibilities fascinating. As we talked, I ventured that the concept of heaven, which both Islam and Christianity share, may relate theologically to the notion of parallel universe, and that the concept of resurrection could be a theological corollary to a wormhole. <laughs> We launched into a theological discussion of these themes from Muslim and Christian perspectives. When I asked whether he had discussed his work with the leader of any mosque, he said that the imams and mullahs in Peshawar would frown on his work, so he would not be inclined to discuss it with them. Well, I, as a Christian mullah, <laughs> felt honored that he was happy to discuss it with me. Now here's an example of pursuing a topic as far as we could go and then seeing it would be unwise to pursue it further. Some faculty members and I were chatting in the garden outside our meeting room while awaiting some late arrivals when talk turned to a member who was there who had recently returned from Hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca that every Muslim is obligated to make at least once during his or her lifetime. After we heard about how his experience had gone, I remarked that I had noticed on the Hajj TV stations, and in Pakistan there are 
three or four Hodge TV stations that just, just continually broadcast the procession around the Kaaba from Hajj and, and, and year round. I noticed on the stations that men and women process together around the Kaaba in the great sacred mosque of Mecca, the holiest shrine in all of Islam. The Kaaba being the house of worship built by Abraham with one black stone thought to be remaining from the original structure. So I noted the contrast with most mosques where men and women are strictly separated. When I asked why there is such a difference, it was clear not only that no one had an answer, but that no one considered it wise to speculate on reasons for that difference. Well, I'm a speculator. So I continued the conversation by noting that the vestments and singing processions in Christian worship arose out of an anticipation of what heaven might be like. You know, every time we go into liturgy, really what we're, what we're anticipating is what, you know, is, entry into heaven with all the beauty and the songs and the dais up front and you know we don't fall down and worship but perhaps we should uh, so and we read about that in the revelation to Saint John the Divine on analogy with that I wondered aloud whether the mixed procession around the Kaaba might enact a Muslim vision of gender equality in heaven an eschatological anticipation how things will be at the consummation of all things. Well, that was a conversation stopper. <laughs> and I knew better than to pursue the matter further. What I was encountering was the strict limit Peshawar Muslims felt on theological inquiry and speculation. Many in Peshawar were reluctant to talk about religion at all because of its sensitivity. My view was that the sensitivity of religion made it all the more important to talk about. In a situation of religious polarization, where Muslims misunderstood Christians and Christians misunderstood Muslims, it was especially important to open channels of spiritual and theological discussion. As important and difficult as it was to cultivate tolerance, we needed to move beyond tolerance to mutual discovery. Only so could we overcome the sense of the two religions being two great dark unknowns to each other. Each conversation could be a point of light, an extension of understanding, a small stone in building up a foundation of mutual trust. What I'm saying to you is, if that's possible in Peshawar, it's possible where you are. Be it Columbus, or one of the suburbs, or wherever else in the country you may be from. We tend to be frightened by interreligious dialogue. We live in an environment where the consequences, negative consequences could be minimal. And so I encourage you to grasp the nettle. So to summarize the second section of my talk, I've considered, I've counseled us to incarnational humility and I've encouraged a stance of mutual discovery. The title of tomorrow morning's talk is Christian Muslim Maelstrom Building Toward a Future. I will focus on Muslim, Muslims and Christians discussing our common interest in propagation, what Christians term and Muslims term dawah, and on the struggle for reconciliation, and a few other topics. So that concludes this evening's talk. Thank you for your attention. And now we'll have a time for questions and discussion.